During sixth grade, my friends were my life. For any girl that age, it's really important to have friends, especially your first year of middle school. When I came back the first day of seventh grade, I had no reason to believe anything would be different. I hosted a Halloween party because everybody wanted to trick or treat together. There was many costumes. Hello Kitty, me, 80s girls, Barbies, and the peanut characters. I thought these would be my friends until I graduated high school. Then something changed. A few weeks later, the first dance came along and I was expecting to get invited to one of my friend's houses to get ready. But I was wrong. 14 out of 15 people in my group had plans. And guess who didn't? Me. From then on, I wasn't invited to anything after school. The oddest thing was that they would be nice to me in school, but they would never invite me to do anything after. That was confusing. February 8th was a horrible night. I had just gotten home from a volleyball game and I logged into iChat. I asked my last remaining friend in that group if she was mad at me because she'd been acting weird around me lately. She said, no, not really, and I was relieved. But then she went on to say that everybody in the group didn't like me anymore and I should pursue other friend options. She also said that everybody could tell I was uncomfortable and I would never talk at the lunch table. Even though I really did not want this to be true, in the back of my mind, I knew it was. I was devastated. I went downstairs and cried on my mom's shoulder for an hour, begging her to let me transfer to another school the next day. I knew this girl was my last link to this group. I knew if anything happened between us that I'd be out of this group forever. Not being in this group would be like a total social status change. Once you were out, there'd be certain people that would probably never talk to me again just because I wasn't in the group. I decided to go to the school the next day and act like nothing had happened. I followed them around like usual, but for the first time, nobody said a word to me. It was as if the girl on iChat had told them everything that she said to me, and they were all just going along with it. I for, tried for two months after this horrible night to get back in the group. I did everything I could, but nothing worked. I was out, I was alone, and I had no friends left in that group, and basically no friends, period. I had hit rock bottom. I felt sad, lonely, and helpless. Whenever a teacher wanted to meet with me, I wanted to meet with them at lunch, because that means I didn't have to sit with the other kids. Or, I would run up to the library as soon as I was done eating, just so I didn't have to follow them around. I began to realize I had no choice but to accept the fact and make new friends. I'd known this girl for a while, and I decided to reach out for her. She was an awesome girl and wasn't in the group. She gave me everything a friend needed to give me, and that I didn't get from my other friends. She gave me time, hugs, laughs, and support, and that's truly what a good friend needs to give you. As the school year came to an end, I didn't have many friends, and I didn't ha see anybody from school that summer. I knew I needed to find new friends for the next year. Over the summer, I attended Girls Leadership Institute, where I began to learn how to identify a healthy relationship. GLI would always say that there's a better friend out there for you, and I was beginning to realize that there was. As the start of eighth grade became closer and closer, I became more and more nervous because I knew I had to do diff things differently this year. Walking to school on the first day of eighth grade was so scary. I honestly didn't have any true friends in school walking in. The first day at lunch, I didn't sit with my old group. I summoned all my courage and walked right past them. It felt so good. One, one girl from my old group looked back at me, shocked. But I, honest, I brushed it off because honestly, I didn't care what she thought of me anymore. And now I have the greatest friends a girl could ask for. They gave me love, hugs, laughs, and support. They were the better friends out there for me. My mom always said friendship is really not about winning or losing, but after losing on the friend front for a while, I finally won and it feels amazing. Isn't she amazing? I think Claire's story really illuminates the way that relationships can be a source of incredible resilience and joy for girls, but they're also a kind of kryptonite because there's very little that can bring a girl psychologically to her knees, like a lost or a threatened relationship. If we want girls to be resilient, we've got to give them the skills to navigate the challenges that those connections pose so that they can remain in close connected relationships with others. 
Yet I think there's a myth in our society that just because girls have lots of relationships means they must have intuitive abilities to manage them. And it's simply not true. Girls need help in this area. And I find that saying girls need any kind of help these days is not easy at all. Um, because in the United States and in many countries like it, there's never been a better time to be a girl. And countries all over the world, as we just heard, are realizing that investing in girls is the right thing to do. Now, in this country, girls outpace boys in test scores, high school and college enrollment and graduation rates, um, leadership positions in high school. And yet, it all depends on what you're measuring. Because for decades now, psychologists have measured an alarming loss of self-esteem in girls as they approach adolescence. And this is a loss that cuts across ethnic, racial, and socioeconomic lines. We think at this moment, girls become aware of pressure to be conventionally feminine, to be liked at all costs, to be pleasing, to be passive, to be modest. So, if their college applications are stamped with 21st century girl power, and they are, we also see their psychological resumes lagging generations behind. In a 2006 study, 74% of girls told researchers they were under a lot of pressure to please everyone. Those girls said they were not supposed to brag about the things that they did well. In my own research, when I ask girls, what is a good girl to you, they'll tell me it's a girl who has to do everything perfect, never disappoint someone, be liked by everyone. So despite this age of girl power, girls continue to get conflicting messages about power and personal authority from the culture. Um, and not surprisingly, after college, the data on girls begins to decline. Women enter professions that pay them less, that offer them less prestige. In 2011, uh, we only had about 15% of women occupying board positions um, and corporate leadership positions. So these amazing girls suddenly become known for more troubling distinctions. Uh, they may be less likely to ask for a raise, to manage conflict and failure, um, and to advocate for themselves. It's not unusual to overhear a college graduate, an elite college graduate, sitting in a job interview talking like this, posing her statements as questions so that she doesn't take up too much space and act too aggressive. <laughs> I won't keep talking like that. <laughs> Rest assured. Now, let me be really clear that there are still many institutional barriers that exist, sexist barriers that exist that prevent women from being successful. And we know research is out there that says that aggressive women are not well responded to. But I'm convinced a psychological glass ceiling exists as well. And it begins from as a product of a culture that is telling girls, yes, but. Yes, you be powerful, but you still be nice while you do it. Yes, you be smart, but make sure you don't make anyone uncomfortable with your intelligence. Yes, you can be active, but you be sexy and skinny while you do it. <laughs> now, I think this glass ceiling starts long before a young woman's first day on the job. I believe many of the challenges facing women's leadership begin in girlhood. I want you to picture a classroom full of first grade girls. You ask them, who's the best runner in the classroom? Every single hand goes up, I'm the best runner. And by the way, if you have not hung out with a six-year-old girl recently, I highly recommend it. They are fierce, <laughs> totally. <laughs> Just a little note. Now, if you ask that question of fifth or sixth grade girls, they'll usually point to the best runner. She's the best runner. Ask that question to ninth grade girls, and the pointed out best runner will be wary of the distinction. Because to be seen as the best often earns you the punishment of your peers and other adults. In adulthood, women will pay a steep financial price for that modesty. People who negotiate their raises and negotiate salary increases make a million dollars more than those who do not over the course of their careers. So while girls may look sparkling on paper, I think what they need help with is their inner resume. The inner resume are the skills to know exactly what you think and feel, and the skills to express those with conviction. They are the skills to assert a minority opinion, to say, I disagree, even if the rest of you agree. These are the skills to face challenge with grace, to raise your hand in class and not know the right answer. How do we do that? I think we come back to relationships, I think, which are an incredible source of resilience for girls. 
Relationships provide an in-house classroom every day for girls to learn how to be better leaders. If you think about it, their relationships with, with their peers, adults, offer them opportunities to learn how to advocate for themselves, negotiate, and compromise. And so when girls are able to do that, for example, if you give a 10-year-old girl the skills to tell her friend to stop bossing her around, you begin helping her flex the muscles that she will need to ask for something difficult in the workplace years down the road. If you give a 13-year-old girl like Claire the courage, the access to the courage to walk past those friends, she starts building the skill set she will need to face risk. I now work with college students and we talk about how if you can tell your roommate to turn the music down or clean her side of the room, and this is no small thing for a college student, <laughs> hear me out on this. She is flexing the muscles she needs to navigate conflict. So these opportunities are all around girls. Relationships are the class that girls are paying attention to the most. So let's use them. I can't conclude without talking about the powerful role that adult women play in girls' lives. And I'm very proud to have my mother, Claire, in the audience with us today. Um, yes. My mom um, had a powerful role in my own inner resume development. She was a teacher at the school that I attended and would take my brother and me after school uh, for snacks. And we would go to a restaurant, go down the cafeteria line, and something would happen. I could see it coming from a mile away, and it drove me insane. My mother would start to feel the french fries on the little trolley of food. <laughs> and if they weren't hot enough, she would ask the fry cook to reheat them. I want you to understand this was the most humiliating thing my mother could ever, <laughs> ever do to me. And I would stand there and I would just be bursting into flames. Mom, just eat the fries. <laughs> Stop being so rude. The fries are fine. My mother looked at me like I was insane. Now, years later, I was skiing in my late 20s. I pulled over to eat, sat down, ate a french fry and without thinking about it, walked right over to the person who had made them for me. <laughs> and I said, could you please reheat these fries? And in that moment, I realized my mom had given me the script to ask for what I needed, the permission and the sense of authority, the sense that I was entitled to that. I wasn't ready for it at the age of 9, 10, 11, 22. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but when I was ready, I was able to draw on it. The moral of this story, ladies and gentlemen, is embarrass your daughters. Thank you. <laughs>